Hello, everybody, and welcome into Payoff Pitch, Action Network's Major League Baseball betting podcast presented by BetMGM. I am your host today, Charlie DeSterco, filling in for Brendan Glasheen, joined by Sean Zarello. We're talking Friday, best bets here on the podcast where you can hear our favorite bets every Monday, Tuesday, and Friday morning during the regular season. So subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Find us on the Action Network's YouTube page as well. Just a reminder, you know, we're recording these the night before, so Sunday, Monday, and Thursday night for the following days. Best bets. If you haven't heard, so now you hear it. Friday, May 24th, we're breaking down that slate. It's a 15-game slate. We're going to start with best bets. Zorillo, where are you headed? Yeah, so I was going to join you initially on the Mets money line, and then that ended up moving a little bit too far away from where I had it projected. So I do like the Mets still. I'm assuming you are going to give them out as your best bet since we chatted about that earlier. But for my best bet for Friday overnight, I'm going to go with the Cubs in the first five innings and continue to ride Shota Imanaga, who will have the wind blowing away from him for the first time in his major league career. It seems like Shota has either pitched in a weather neutral environment or had the wind blowing at his back and blowing against the hitters in all of his major league starts thus far. But finally going to be going out nine miles an hour to left field on Friday. So we'll see how how much that impacts him just because the ERA has been so low. The home run of fly ball rate has been so low, even though he is giving up a high number of fly balls. But he's still just such a better pitcher than Miles Mikolas. And Shota, despite that very low ERA, still a 2.6 expected ERA, 3.1 expected FIP, 23% strikeout minus walk rate. Compare that to Miles Mikolas, 4.9 expected ERA. He was at 544 last season, a 411 expected fit so a whole run higher than what Shota has done to this point in the season and a 12.2 percent strikeout minus walk rate roughly half of Shota's strikeout minus walk rate and all roughly in the same territory as what Mikolas did last season so multi-year sample where Miles Mikolas is pitching like a replacement level pitcher ERA the season a little better underlying metrics or I should say the the pitch modeling metrics a little bit better for Miles Mikolas this year but that said, still project a substantial difference between these two starters, at least a run on a season-long year array, if not closer to a run and a half or two runs. So uh, just in terms of the splits, because this Cardinals team has generally hit better against lefties than righties in recent years, this year they're 27 against left-handed pitching, 77 WRC+. Plus. The Cubs below average against righties, but 19th. And uh, in terms of how I project them out, I do give the Cubs a slight splits advantage facing a righty, whereas the Cardinals are a league average team for me against the left-handed pitcher. So projected this at minus 166 for the first five innings, and we will keep riding Shota in his first start against unfamiliar opponents, where I do think he has a particularly big advantage when they're seeing him for the first time. Yeah, Shota, rookie of the year favorite, going up there in the Cy Young race, and you mentioned it, the St. Louis Cardinals, not as good against left-handed pitching this year, down at 27 WRC+. plus. One of the first things I wrote down when I when I broke down this slate was Shota over outs, question mark. Feels like mm-hmm. one of those things, pitching you know, has the high strikeout rate, but also a lot of lefties in this Cardinals lineup, so no matter how they try to match him, feels like you know that six-plus inning wheelhouse, if you can get that, um, is where to go, but... Obviously, there's no props out in that market right now. And Cubs you mentioned coming off a bowl game game today too, where they use Ben Brown, they use yep. Kyle Hendricks in relief, so probably need innings from him too. I mean, obviously, you could always bring in your key relievers, but uh, just may need to lean on him a little bit more for innings at the start of a weekend. Right. So definitely think not look toward the strikeouts. Cardinals don't strike out despite having such a lefty yep. high lineup. They don't strike out that much against lefties. But I do think if you if there is a you know 16, 17 and a half out out there, looking toward that for Shota. Might be the move. You know, we've seen Goldschmidt, Arenado. They're not totally the same players this season in general in that middle of the Cardinals lineup. But you mentioned the New York Mets. The line has moved a bit since open, and I texted you. My gut says Mets. My heart says I'm an idiot, but I'm going to double down on being an idiot. I'm not dumb. I'm just a little stupid. The New York Mets money line here. Christian Scott on the mound against Kyle Harrison, and I just think Scott's the better pitcher. You look at the metrics thus far for Scott. Obviously, just a few starts, a small sample size, but an XCRA right around 3.1. His stuff plus grades out above league average. His pitching plus right around league average. He's limiting barrels. Hard hit rate is down and low. And he generates a near 30% whiff rate on three of his four pitches, which I was pretty surprised about just to see how much swing and miss stuff he has. He hasn't gotten you know the high strikeout numbers that we kind of saw in the minors 
all together thus far, but three pitches that are generating 30 plus percent whiff rate and his fastball due for some positive regression as well. He's just been mauled by a 340 batting average on balls in play, expecting some positive regression to come his way. I like him a lot. I think the Mets really have a gem here with him on the mound. And Kyle Harrison, you know, he is a, a little bit of above average league pitcher, right? Like 4, 4.1 X ERA, X fit right around 4.4. So maybe do some negative regression a little bit, a 92 stuff plus rating. But I'm a little bit more concerned given his higher barrel rate, a little bit more of a fly ball rate. He should be giving up more home runs. You look at last season compared to this. He has 2.1 home runs per nine last year. This year, just 0.82. So expecting that number to kind of go up. The Mets, the offense has not been the entire issue of late. It's mostly been the bullpen, um, which is, you know, a little bit scary in general. But I think the offense should be able to get to Kyle Harrison here. And, you know, we keep talking about sometimes it's hard to handicap, and we'll talk about this more, bullpen usage the night before. The Giants, they played a day game, back-to-back extra inning games. Tyler Rogers threw three games in three days. Randy Rodriguez back-to-back games as well. Duvall obviously had the night out, but he's been working 25-plus pitch innings almost every time he's out on the mound right now. I think this is the bottom of the market of the Mets. I think they're our best bet. Sean, I know you're on them as well. Uh, you put that in, and then I po- followed you just shortly thereafter. I was like, screw it. We're going to go in together. So hand-in-hand diving on the New York Mets. Yeah, projected this line closer, minus 150. And something you didn't mention about Kyle Harrison is the home road splits, which are pretty stark. It's not just the fact that he pitches at Oracle Park, allows a lot of fly balls, and those fly balls die at Oracle Park and don't go out of the park for home runs, but his strikeout minus walk rate is half on the road what it is at home. So just less effective, maybe has a better feel for the mound at home, but regardless of the fact, like just seeing a half strikeout minus walk rate home versus road, that is pretty surprising. For most pitchers, there's a slight dip in that strikeout minus walk rate. It's not... 18%, 18.8% 18%, 18.8% versus 9.4%, literally half home versus road. Uh, really like Christian Scott, 117 stuff plus on his slider, 113 on his splitter. And his fastball doesn't grade as well, just the 90 stuff plus rating, but he has really good command of it, throws it aggressively up in the zone, and he has really good extension on the pitch as well. So I think it plays better than the stuff plus grade. Actually shows 38% strikeout rate in AAA, would expect the strikeouts to start mm-hmm. coming in the majors at some point. And the Mets did have a day off today where, as you mentioned, the Giants played back-to-back extra inning games. I mean, three straight crazy bananas yeah. games against the Pirates where each team traded off having late in comebacks. So, yeah, really tough series. A lot of high leverage pitches in that series for that Giants bullpen. And the Mets getting their key relievers rested and ready to go. Hopefully Edwin Diaz finding something in the tank uh, at some point soon. But... You look at Diaz's numbers, they're they're kind of back to where they were before his dominant 2022 season. You know, they're they're back more in that 2021 range, and he's still a very effective arm, but not quite the best relief pitcher in baseball anymore. I think Mason Miller likely has that title. So uh, Reed Garrett, you know, is, is stepping yeah. up, and I think ha- having his arm ready to go for Friday could be a big key behind uh, Christian Scott, but hopefully Scott doesn't need it and just cruises through eight innings. Yeah, it, it's interesting. And, and plus, with Reed Garrett, if the Mets find themselves in this close game, I wouldn't be surprised to see him throw two innings to get to yeah. Diaz to do the seventh, eighth, ninth. We've seen that happen before with the Mets. You know, the guys like Adam Adovino, a bit inconsistent, but you know with Garrett, you at least have an elite option to get to Diaz, who, as you mentioned, up and down of late. But we'll definitely see how that goes. Hopefully the Mets are able to close the door, not have the bullpen blow this one. But let's move on to fade the public here. And we're keying in Dodgers, Reds, 95% of the bets coming in and 99% of the cash on the Dodgers. Money line, James Paxton taking the mound for LA. And Sean, I'll, obviously I'll let you go in a second, but just quick thought on my end is when I look at J- J- when I look at Paxton and I look at his metrics, I don't understand how the hell this guy has not gotten it harder. A 74 stuff plus, an 89 pitching plus. So everything that he flashes is not great. His expected ERA is up at 5-6. You look at his actual ERA down at 2-8. He's striking out as many batters as he's walking. A zero strikeout minus walk rate. And he's giving up double-digit barrels. Fly balls galore. It's not, it's not like this man is striking out a ton of people. It's not like this guy is putting the ball on the ground. And it's not like he's generating the weakest contact. 
I lean toward looking at his under outs, assuming that it's above 15 and a half here. He threw six innings against the Reds last time. I'm a bit nervous when it comes to backing the Reds just because of their offense. It can be inconsistent at times. Ellie's better against righties than he is lefties. In general, the Reds give me a little bit of heebie-jeebies, especially watching the San Diego Padres game yesterday just, or tonight that we're recording, the blown the blown lead there in the uh, extra innings. They just don't have the best arms. But you are at least based on your projections, looking toward fading the public here, and that's backing Cincinnati. Yeah, I feel like every time I bet against James Paxton and Tyler Anderson, the the call an ambulance <laughs> but not for me meme pops up on my computer. It's just like these guys just keep taking my money every time yeah. out. And <laughs> I can't quantify why they're pitching so much better than their underlying indicators show other than just great sequencing luck. And by that, I mean – giving up one extremely hard hit ball for an extra base hit in every single inning without those extra base hits sequencing together and, you know, having an extended stretch where you actually allow the base runners to score. Like they're giving up a ton of hard hit balls. They're not striking out batters. They're walking too many guys, but yet every single time the runner gets stranded on second base because they're only giving up one hit and one walk in the inning and that's it. And they're spreading it out over the course of multiple innings. And you mentioned it, Paxton, 24 strikeouts, 24 walks this season. Has been a little, a little bit better in his past three starts. Nine strikeouts, two walks. Maybe that command coming around a little bit, but 74 stuff plus rating. His fastball when he came back with Boston last year was sitting in the sitting around 95, 97. Uh, and then it started to dwindle later in the year. And this year he's sitting around 93.5. So the fastball is down nearly two ticks year over year sitting where it was when he kept going on the IL every season. There's really no indicators to suggest that he's anywhere near his previous level or likely to break out of the current level he's showing. And a 284 ERA, a 554 expected ERA, there's a massive disconnect there. So I am expecting James Paxton to get shelled at some point. On the other end, Graham Ashcraft is a guy who always pops by stuff plus numbers. 114 stuff plus. Models love his cutter. They love his slider, but he has a career 9% strikeout minus walk rate, which is about 5% below the league average. Career 431 expected FIP. He's got a 4.4 expected ERA this season. So pitching models say he should be a well above average pitcher, but the results say he's closer to a league average starter, if not slightly below average. So I haven't upgraded Ashcraft, but I have downgraded Paxton, or I've at least left his projections where they are. I haven't upgraded him relative to where he was, you know, earlier in the season. I've basically projected him as the same pitcher all along, even though he's managed to suppress that ERA, but projected this closer to plus 130, bet the Reds at plus 145, and saw the market immediately tick down after I entered that bet. So we'll see. Normally, I, I like to wait, you know, betting against teams like the Dodgers. I typically expect a line like this to blow out and cross plus 150 overnight and get the Reds at a better price in the morning? Maybe it does. But I felt like locking it in. It seemed like there was some resistance around that plus 145 number. So we'll see where it is when we wake up in the morning. But I wouldn't really go past plus 140. Yeah, you mentioned line opened up. Dodgers money poured in early. Then we've seen some Reds buyback since. It, James Paxton, man. I... He, I might wake up in the middle of the night with nightmares from him just based on how he's been able to avoid this negative regression that every sign points toward that one. But like his outs, if it's on, if it's around 15 and a half, I don't think he's going to be able to pitch deep into this game. Also, maybe look at the strikeouts. He had just two against the Reds. Not sure where that line will open up, but we talk about it. A 13% strikeout rate. That's bottom five of all five percentile in all pitchers. The Reds had two home runs against them last time, but just three total hits. So should see some negative regression, and we'll see if the Reds are able to get that home for Sean's fade the public pick. But it's time for some underdogs now. Sean, I'll, get, I'll kick it right back to you, passing the rock right back to you. You're heading out to Kansas City, Tampa. The Rays fresh off a sweep. They got swept by the Boston Red Sox, and now they're welcoming in Kansas City, who's red hot as well. You like the Rays. Yeah, the Rays, you know, obviously it has nothing to do with this specific matchup, but the Rays are the most profitable home underdog in the Action Labs database since 2005. They have a 9.6% ROI, Colorado second at 7.3%. And 
again, it doesn't have anything to do with this specific matchup, but I do think in general, the Rays have been the most undervalued and underrated organization in baseball over the past decade plus, right? Talked about in my preseason win projections article, this team is typically under projected by an average of nine wins relative to their end of season finish. So undervalued going into a season, undervalued concerning preseason win totals, and certainly undervalued when they're a home underdog pretty consistently over the past 16 plus years. So generally speaking, the Rays undervalued and obviously they lost Josh Lowe again. You know, their lineup has taken a big hit. They really do struggle to score runs. They're going to play a bullpen, bullpen game on Mon- or on, uh, I keep thinking today is Sunday and that we're talking about Monday slate, but they're going to throw a bullpen game on Friday led by Sean, Sean Armstrong. And they had Thursday off to rest their bullpen. They'll get Monday off to rest their bullpen. They're going to throw Aaron Savali and Taj Bradley over the weekend. So they can be pretty aggressive with their bullpen usage on Thursday behind Armstrong. And Armstrong has some pretty interesting metrics. Expected ERA around four. He was a sub four X ERA guy last year. And Seth Lugo has been great too. 1.8 ERA, 3.6 expected ERA. Strikeout minus walk rate pretty much where it was last year with the Padres, but showing a career best walk rate. So I think we're going to see really good pitching in this matchup throughout. Like I said, the Rays can be very aggressive with their bullpen usage. Lugo has been great, and that Rays lineup is pretty weak. So I made this total 7.5. I like the under 8, and I also like the Rays projecting them closer to minus 116. So minus 105 or better on the home dog, and then under 8 down to about minus 105. Yeah, I the Rays are another team that I had written down because I look at Lugo – and it's interesting. He has a 90% strand rate, so you'd expect some negative regression to come mm-hmm. on that end. He's Yes, he's limiting hard hits more, but a 253 BABIP, his strikeout, he has two back-to-back 10-plus strikeout games. I'm assuming, based on just his underlying numbers, 36 percentile in whiff rate, 45th in chase rate, that'll come down. We've talked about this, I don't know how many times on the pod. Uh, the Rays have had the hardest stuff plus to date coming into this, and, and obviously the, the success has co- come and gone. Throughout the race, the race can go so lefty heavy. I'm looking kind of toward maybe fading Lugo. I don't know if it's an outs or a strikeouts here. Um, I think that the Rays just going lefty heavy can give some issues. I thought they could have done that to Brian Bayo, and they did for a little bit before everything kind of crumbled. On uh, I believe it was Wednesday that they played. I, I I'm very nervous about if Alexander gets the bulk of the load, how he'll perform. That's like where I kind of like got a little bit shaky, but. Definitely also like the Rays in this one at home. My favorite underdog, though, is the LA Angels. And the last time I was on this pod, or the last time I wrote up opening pitch, that that rather, I talked about Patrick Sandoval and how he's due for some positive regression. And against the Texas Rangers, it came. He won the first five. He was fantastic. And I think that's still going to come because you still look at his underlying metrics. A 351 batting average on balls in play a 64% strand rate. Then you look into the, the dig into the numbers underlying metrics, a 3.6 X ERA, a 3.05 fit. He still is ERA right around 4.6. So you look at this guy who has a higher strikeout rate than last year. He's giving up less free passes. He's limiting more barrels. His hard hit rates right around 35, 36%. His underlying metrics right around that 98 to 100% of stuff plus or, or average of stuff plus pitching plus all of that right around 99, 98. So he's a league average pitcher in that regard of his stuff. I think that he has the edge over here over Logan Allen. You look at Logan Allen, we talked about how bad James Paxton's been, 75 stuff plus. Now, Logan Allen does have 100 location plus and a 92 pitching plus, so it's a little bit better than Paxton. But he's a lefty that has doesn't have the best stuff. He's giving up a lot of hard hits. The hard hit rate at 45%, in the bottom 15% of all pitchers in that regard. And he's not generating the same swings and misses that he normally does. And he's getting barreled a little bit more. So I think given his recent success, back-to-back six out, six shutout innings, now he's getting the Angels on deck. I think this is the buy spot on the Angels and the fade spot on, sell spot on Logan Allen. I think I'm going to continue to buy Sandoval. The Angels, sixth and left-handed pitching when it comes to WRC+. Plus. Cleveland's fifth, but you know we know the whole story with Cleveland. But I actually like the Angels here. Um, you know, they're right around a pick them on first five. I also like them as a slight underdog at home here. So I'm going with the angels as my underdog 
Uh, and Sean, you're going with the Rays for your underdog. So that's our underdogs of the day. All right. Let's get out of here in just a moment. Sean, you'll round us up with a couple final best bets, and then I'll discuss maybe a couple of home run props that I'm looking at for Friday slate. Yeah, just to piggyback off of the Angels. So I like the Angels in the first five innings up to about minus 123. Let's go. As you mentioned, Sandoval with the pitching edge over Logan Allen. And I think the concerning thing is the offensive splits for the Guardians. They were 29th against lefties last year. They were 25th two years ago. It's been a consistent problem for them in their offensive profile. Their league average against righties the past couple of years. They've been a bottom five team against lefties this year. As you said, they're fifth against left-handed pitching. So I don't know what this transformation is. It is largely (laughs) a very similar position player group that they're trotting out there, but suddenly they're hitting better in general, but they're also hitting lefties much better. However, that strikeout rate is still bottom 10 against left-handed pitching. So maybe you'll see some slight regression there. If you're going to choose one data point to be most predictive of like how a pitcher is going to perform going forward or how a team is going to perform, it's strikeout rate. Just even throw out strikeout minus walk rate. Like strikeout rate is the most highly correlated stat. You know, hitters, obviously bad. Pitchers, obviously good. But to future performance, strikeout rate is very predictive. So seeing the Guardians with a top five WRC plus against lefties, but a bottom 10 strikeout rate, I actually think that strikeout rate is a little bit more predictive than their performance to date. But yeah, Sandoval, you know, the last season is an outlier. 4.7 4.7 expected ERA, 8% strikeout minus walk rate. Two years ago, he was at 14%. This year, he's at 14%. And you see the expected ERA come back down. And as you mentioned as well, Charlie, all the luck categories, Babbitt, strand rate, say that Sandoval should be better. So going to trust those things. Angels first five up to minus 123. Discussed the Mets already, but didn't mention the under. I do like the under eight. In Queens tomorrow, I actually like the under seven and a half as well. I set this total closer to seven between Harrison and Christian Scott. So under seven and a half to about minus one ten would be a bet for me between Mets and Giants. Another under seven and a half Yankees and Padres. You Darvish throwing the ball really well this year. Coming into the year, I was kind of down on him, kind of out on him. He's got a sub three expected ERA this season, and he's pitching like it. And Carlos Rodon is pitching much better. Of late for the Yankees, too. The Yankees' rotation looks absolutely tremendous. Luis yeah. Hill, they, they don't even need Garrett Cole at the moment. They're pitching so well. Uh, but, you know, Rodon showing really improved command. Three walks across his last five starts. 33 strikeouts over the same span. His location numbers, his location plus numbers, steadily rising throughout the season. The stuff plus has been there all along this year. It's the command that has been wonky and it seems like he's finally getting it back. So projected the total in San Diego closer to 6.9 and like the under seven and a half between the Yankees and Padres. And then lastly, going with an over between the Astros and the A's over seven and a half set this total closer to 8.5 big time wind in Oakland tomorrow, 15 miles an hour blowing out to right center. I think Justin Verlander finally showing his age a little bit, 8.6% strikeout minus walk rate. Um, he's at a 10% walk rate too. So just showing no command 7% for his career. He was at 7% last season. His velocity is down a half a tick. His stuff plus numbers are down. He's 41 years old. It's a matter of time before we see cracks in this profile. But on top of that, the A's had a couple of grinding games, uh, against the Colorado Rockies or I think three games that all like were tight and late. And involved two of which involved Mason Miller. He actually gave up some runs today, but their bullpen really got overworked and stretched out in that series. So down on Verlander, I think the A's bullpen is a little tired and getting serious wind in a park that doesn't necessarily, you know, boost when you get that wind effect. But unlike Oracle Park, there is actually data suggesting when those wind numbers are there. Uh, Oakland Coliseum does boost the run environment. You know, when you see the wind blowing out at Oracle Park in San Francisco, doesn't actually mean as much with the water there. For some reason, you know, across the bay in Oakland, the wind means a whole lot more on the effects of that park. So over between Astros and A's, up to about eight and minus one ten. Yeah, I you I think you've convinced me on this over because I, I looked at this game and 
The guy that I circled in this one is I think Jordan Alvarez is about to have an upswing. If you look at his mm. hard hit rate, his isolated power, it's starting to make an upswing on his graphs of late. A lot better at bats. Finally did get that home run, had that mental day off. Ross Stripling also awful against left-handed hitters, which obviously Tucker and Jordan will be batting back-to-back. Has a 345 average and a near 900 OPS this season against lefties. So the Astros are able to stack that middle of the lineup with left-handed hitters. So I think that the Astros are definitely going to be able to put up runs. And you mentioned it, right? Like Mason Miller just threw 26 pitches yes, today. Finally see mortal. Kelly, Bielek, they're not going to be available. You would assume, you know, they, they still have some of their top arms. But again, a grinding series against Colorado. Another similar to that Pittsburgh-San Francisco game. A lot of extra innings. A lot of pitches had to be thrown. A lot of high leverage yeah. situations. Could see, you know, maybe this game spiral out of hand with Ross Stripling or... Verlander shows some cracks and the runs start following in the, the athletics offense has been, you know, much better of like Brent Rucker playing really well. So I think I might join you on that over your Don was the guy that I was looking at for homers. And then the other two that I was thinking about Tyler Stevenson uh, hit one against James Paxton in that first game. Uh, you look at his numbers against left-handed pitching and it's incredible. A 144 WRC plus and a 300 isolated power this season. He has three home runs in very limited at-bats. You just look against left-handed pitching. He's crushing the ball barrel right through the roof. So if there's a guy that's going to be able to take advantage of Paxton soft throwing and low strikeouts, which Stevenson, a bit of a free swinger, could see a lot of home runs. And if the wind's blowing out at the right price, Stevenson's a guy that I circled. And then this one's, I don't know if, if the bias is showing here because I know you have the under in this game, but Fernando Tatis, like you look at of late, his hard hit rate is turning around. Last season, he had a 227 isolated power. This season, it's really bad, but does have a positive WRC plus against left handed pitching despite hitting under the Mendoza line. Radon does give a lot of barrels, does give up a ton of fly balls. I think, you know, a guy like Tatis might be able to take advantage of it. Aside from that game against Chris Sale, has really seen his strikeouts kind of dip a little bit back down because, you know, he was striking out two, almost two times a game the last in the early going of May. So the three guys that I was looking at as far as maybe total bases or home runs go, Jordan, Tatis, and Tyler Stevenson. But yeah, I'm looking at Ray's money line, looking at the Astros A's over with you as well, but haven't officially fired it yet. I believe Tyler Stevenson ranks really highly, not only in terms of uh, the new swing metrics that just came out, swing speed and swing length, but also in terms of Seager, which is, you know, pitch recognition and swinging at the right pitches, taking the right pitches. So I think there's a chance Tyler Stevenson just takes off at some point. Finally. If you need a catcher in a fantasy league, or you're looking to play props, looking for the Reds offense, maybe get going at some point. I think Tyler Stevenson is going to have a little breakout. Yeah, see where he ends up in the lineup. Five home runs thus far. Uh, I feel like you know he has 20 home run upside, if not a little bit higher, given yeah. just hard, his hard hit rate and barrel rate being in the top. We've been saying it for on. years. He's got 25 home run upside. We'll, we'll see if he finally puts it together. But I mean, all the metrics say that him and Matt Chapman should be significantly better hitters than they are. Chapman's been on a little bit of a tear. So maybe now that these, you know, these guys are being told that they're supposed to be good hitters, right? Because all these <laughs> metrics that are popping, they're like, oh, maybe I should be a little bit better and finally mashing the ball. So how do you see Matt Chapman the- going? Maybe we'll get Stevenson going too. Yeah, it's, Chapman got the face of the Pittsburgh Pirates bullpen. So that's always a help as well. But uh, hopefully Tyler Stevenson can get it done for all of us because packs the under outs, Tyler Stevenson home run, the Reds money line, all of that together are just some of the bets that you just heard from Sean Zarello and myself, Charlie Disturco here on the Friday episode of the payoff pitch podcast. Don't forget download and follow us on that free award-winning action network app. All of our plays are there and leave us a five-star rating and review wherever you listen to this podcast for a chance to win some action swag or a free action pro subscription. Also, don't forget, check out the Action Network Discord. I kind of hang out there sometimes. Sean Kerner, especially, always there giving out strikeout props. There's a link in that episode description as well. So check it out and pay off pitches. They're going to be coming out every every or every or Monday, Tuesday, Friday, overnight going forward. So make sure you're subscribed to the podcast wherever you get your podcast. It's important to beat the line. These are going to be up you know, in the early morning hours. So by the time you wake up, Maybe you have a bowl of cereal, oatmeal, whatever goes. Anthony DeMondo will have his milk as he listens maybe from far away in uh, Ringerville. But we won't have a podcast on Monday. Just a reminder, due to the holiday, we'll be back Tuesday morning. So happy Memorial Day. 
and ha- enjoy the long weekend. For Sean Zavillo, I'm Charlie DeSerco. We'll be back for best bets on the Tuesday slate. So thanks for listening to Payoff Pitch, Action Network's MLB betting podcast presented by BetMGM. Good luck with all your bets, and we'll see you next time. 